Hello and welcome to the lecture for Lesson 1, Unit 3 of English 2089, where we're going to talk about getting started with our research. So the first lesson is all about what primary research is, and you've kind of been thinking about this and reading about this already. Um, you've read the Dana Lynn Driscoll piece, uh, where she defines what primary research is and talks about um, the methods uh, that you might use to collect that data and how you might go about doing it. Um, and you've also read a bit um, more specifically on interviews, which I've had, you, I've had you read because I think that interviews in particular are truly a learned skill and something that it takes um, observing a good interview to kind of get the hang of. Um, so I wanted to give you some extra practice before you get started with that in case you do conduct interviews because that's a pretty basic data collection method that many of you might be using. So again, the Driscoll piece talked about the, dif the difference between um, primary and secondary research, and the basic difference is that in primary research you are producing the data, and in secondary research you're looking at um, what others have collected and produced and interpreted already. So you're doing the same thing that um, when you write a traditional research paper and you consult a source, that process they've undergone is the one that you're going to undergo. So we're putting you in the driver's seat of being the researcher here with this project. So the um, Driscoll piece, I just want to take a brief moment to draw your attention to a few things and what I think is most useful about this piece. So um, she talks about how research practices vary by community and some of you may have already kind of gotten a sense for this. Um, especially some of you maybe in the social sciences, um, you know, if you're a psychology major, or um, let's say you're um, already doing some lab work in the life sciences or in chemistry, um, you might already have a sense for the ways in which the research we've wed read so far this semester have differed from the kinds of research practices that are undertaken in your own community. So for this research project, we're undertaking the kind of research practices expected in writing studies communities. Um, and different data collection methods serve different purposes. Um, the Driscoll piece talked about observation, surveys, and interviews, and those are all um, data collection methods that serve different kinds of purposes. Um, and by method, of course, I mean um, a way of undergoing research. So um, a method is kind of the practice you use, the um, tool you use, in order to find information. So what will be really useful about this uh, Driscoll piece is keeping it handy for when you start designing and working with those methods. So when you go to design a survey, it's really going to help you to take another look back at the section on surveys so that you can implement some of her um, advice because some of it does get very practical by the end. I'm sure that some of you kind of sped up your reading at that point. Um, keep it handy and relook at those sections as you need to as you start designing and undergoing that research. Um, and also, um, one thing I want to draw your attention to is that um, when we write about primary research that we've conducted, um, our audience expects us to describe what we did to get that information, so the methods and tools that we used, and what it is that we found, of course, which is the results. So you're pretty used to writing about the results of your research already because that's what you're doing when you're writing about secondary research. You're, the, re the ways in which you're going about your work methodologically is that you're reading sources and then you're telling us what kind of interpretation um, and synthesis of that information you come away with. So in primary research we have to be really explicit about how we're conducting our research so that people know how we got our data because that kind of helps an, our audience to interpret what our results truly mean. So there's two important components when we write about the, the information that we collect, describing what you did, how you did it, and then also what it is that you found. And we'll talk a little bit more about that and you'll see um, some, and you'll kind of see this modeled when we read um, a research piece by Tony Mirabelli where he looks at the language and literacy practices of food service workers. Um, we'll be reading that in lesson two and you'll get a good model for, for why it's important to be transparent about how information is collected. Um, one particular aspect of research that I want to draw even more attention to is research ethics. And Driscoll does talk about this, but she talks about it somewhat briefly. 
Um, so up in the Unit 3 sandbox, I have a link to a really quick page on the Purdue Owl that talks a little bit more about research ethics. Um, Driscoll makes a good case for why they're important, but the Purdue Owl page that I've linked to kind of talks more about the practices you can undergo in order to keep your research practices ethical. I also have a couple release forms posted to unit, the Unit 3 sandbox so that you can secure permission from, um, you have a handy form for securing permission from people that you plan to speak to or, or, or talk with. Um, so if you're going to see somebody in person, face to face, then you can give them this form to sign. Um, you could also copy and paste it um, or, or adapt something similar, but copy and paste it if you were you know, working with some kind of online community or somebody you're corresponding with over email. So those are good resources for you to use. And if you have more specific questions about research ethics, as you start designing your project, um, we can talk about that. So I hope to kind of address that when we conference on your paper proposals as well um, next week. But basically, uh, what I really want to get across is that it's very important just to ask permission um, from folks that you're collecting information from. So if you're taking a photograph of them or video recording them, or if you're um, simply even observing them, it, it's very good form to ask their permission. Um, research should always be done with voluntary participants, right? Um, the historical kind of overview that Driscoll gets into talks about how, um, you know, with Nuremberg, it was forced participation. So it needs to be voluntary, and you need to um, be very transparent about what it is you're doing so that people know how their information is going to be used. You know, if you're going to kind of talk about them in a negative way, for instance, you need to be transparent about that so they can truly consider whether or not they want to be associated with the project or whether they want to, you know, have their name used or whether they um, prefer to be anonymous. It's generally common practice to keep participant names anonymous when conducting research with people. Um, and I'm trying to think. Deb Brandt's piece, um, so she used a primary research methodology. She went and spoke, collected narratives from people about their literacy practices and then gave us their stories. And she renamed them in her piece, I believe. You can go back and double check this. But I believe that she um, gave, assigned every participant a pseudonym and only used a first name so that um, they could be kept anonymous. Because, you know, it may be that someone doesn't want their story made public. Um, or at least associated with them, or even if they're okay with it now, they might change their minds later down the road. So these are good practices to get into in order to keep your research ethical and fair. Um, we'll talk a bit more about the research assignment, but I want to just clarify a few things because we're already kind of thinking about it since we're talking about the primary research we're going to be using in order to write it. So for the final research project, we're relying largely on primary research, okay? So this is the chance for you to now kind of take the core, you know, sit in the driver's seat again, um, to take the course ideas that we've been working with and start applying them um, to your own interests, right? So this is where the course works for you. You're now taking the ideas about literacy and genre that we've been talking about this semester and applying them to a community or individual or practice or text that you are interested in. Um, so largely I'm expecting you to work with primary research, but secondary research is also appropriate for this assignment in terms of giving you a sense for conversations around this topic so far. So for instance, um, some of you have talked about um, your, your work in the food service, um, at least I think two of you have. Um, the Tony Mirabelli piece that we're reading is um, very much something that you should be citing in your, in your um, lit review before you get started talking about what it is that you found in your own observations because this is somebody who's already kind of established a context and a conversation that you're entering. You're adding your voice to the conversation he's already began, begun. So um, part of your research proposal that you'll be preparing for next week is to give me a brief indication of what kinds of secondary res uh, resources you're finding that already kind of maybe talk about your topic and what you're going to be doing in terms of collecting your own research um, in, in first hand. Um, and I'm sure this is something we'll talk about more during your proposals, but I want you to keep in mind that um, it's fine to start broad at the beginning of the research process so you can kind of, you know, go in with an open mind and be open to multiple possibilities, but we will want to get very narrow for the paper, especially because for the short mini semester I shorten the length. Um, it only needs to be six to eight pages. Um, usually it's an eight to ten page paper for the full semester. 
So when you're working with such a short paper, it's very important to be very narrow and very specific about what it is you're looking at. And I think Driscoll has a really great example of a way in which a research question can be further narrowed to look at something more particular. If you look at page 159 of the piece that you read. Um, and basically, you know, the piece doesn't have to be about defining a particular discourse community if you don't want it to be. It really can just be about what kinds of writing or literate practices are happening um, within a certain community or by certain individuals within a community. Um, or you could kind of look at text being used by a community. Um, you could write your paper by doing a rhetorical analysis of a text. So this could be an expansion of your genre paper if you wanted it to be. Um, my primary goal is to see you applying the concepts of literacy and, and, and or genre that we've been talking about this semester um, and going out and finding more examples and kind of working with that information. So this can kind of be loosey-goosey, um, but if you want some more direction or guidance or want to bounce some ideas off me, please don't be shy about sending me an email or setting up a time to chat on the Blackboard. So looking ahead, um, the the final piece that you'll be um, uh, completing for lesson one is to draft out a research timeline and also maybe you know potential questions for a survey or interview um, and that's for discussion board number eight um, so I want you to be thinking right away about what you might do in order to start looking at a particular community or person um, this can be tentative this can change um, and some of you may have different communities in mind that you're kind of still deciding between. I just want you to kind of start getting something on paper. So if you wanted, you could put down two different iterations that um, might be two different potential plans you would use with different communities. Or you could um, go ahead and get really specific, knowing that this might change as you go along. But I think it's important just to kind of get something down to paper. It's not a commitment, but just to kind of get started on, in your thinking. Um, and then the first part of lesson two is going to come up pretty quickly, so I want you to be thinking about that. The first part of lesson two asks you um, to um, give us a quick report on some preliminary research collection you've begun. So essentially what this means is that right after you finish drafting your research timeline, I'd like you to spend the weekend doing some form of data collection. First-hand research is a very messy process, as you might imagine. Um, it can kind of go in different directions. You may not gather the information you're expecting. Um, it can often be surprising. So it may be that you know the data you collect ends up changing your direction or topic or idea. That's perfectly fine. The goal is just to get you started with collecting that research so that you're able to kind of see, get, get a better lay for the land, see what's happening within a community you're interested in or with the person you're interested in. Um, in fact, if you are really interested in making this an autobiography, an, an autoethnography, so in other words, like a really intense look at your own practices, we could also discuss that as a possibility as well, though that might be in ways more difficult because it really forces you to look at your own practices and work with an alien eye. So in a way, I think that could be more difficult than looking at somebody else. But that's another possibility. Um, so this should all put you in a good place to um, start drafting your, your research proposal, which is due Wednesday the 29th. Okay, so this stuff's going to happen kind of quickly together. Again, those first two components, that discussion board number eight and blog number six, are designed to kind of get you ready and thinking. It's okay if you change direction completely, but I want you to just kind of get practice with, um, with these data collection methods. So again, feel free to email me if you have questions, and I look forward to seeing what you start to come up with. Thanks.